so happy new year to everyone and uh, before we officially start let uh, let me uh, welcome all of you and uh, let me give a brief introduction of uh, professor he's the professor of anesthesiology uh, he's also committee member of uh, standards and practice parameters from the american society of anesthesiology he has also participated in the uh, practice guidelines on the management of the difficult airway uh, he is also a task force member, um, Puma, which is a project for the universal airway management. Uh, he's also in the working group. He's the director anesthesia for otolaryngology anesthesiology and also the remedy president and founder uh, and professor emeritus for the Society for Airway Management Anesthesiology from Yale uh, University. Uh, so thank you, Professor, and uh, you may begin now. Thank you so much. Okay, thank you so much. And we were just reminiscing on how this is the second time I've been with you, that I was with you almost a year ago. And <laughs> so I'm honored to be back. I'm also honored to be, I believe, I, I trust the first speaker of the year of 2024 in your society. So thank you very much. And uh, would you like we are honored to have you as our first speaker for 2024. Thank you so Thank much you. for you know, joining us. Now, many of you, when you saw the announcement in the flyer for this uh, lecture, you may have thought that I was going to speak on this topic, prevention of esophageal intubation. And I'm not speaking on that topic. This is, of course, something that we expect anesthesiologists and emergency medicine and intensive, intensivists to do all the time is to work hard to prevent esophageal intubation when you're, of course, meaning to intubate the larynx and trachea. In fact, what I'm going to speak on is, is not prevention of esophageal intubation, but rather the prevention of unrecognized esophageal intubation. That is the clinical situation where you've intubated the esophagus, where a clinician has intubated the esophagus, and does not recognize that problem. And of course, we all know that if unrecognition goes and continues, then it can be absolutely devastating. So we wanna prevent unrecognized esophageal intubation, the situation where that can be corrected. And this guideline that we're going to talk about comes from the Project for Universal Management of Airways. And this is that group. This is a group of experts in the field of anesthesiology, critical care medicine, uh, emergency medicine. And we have for now six years uh, joined together by uh, virtual means to discuss issues in airway management with the plan of coming out with this universal airway management guideline. Now, why did we do this? Why did we choose to do this? Well, this article came out in 2019 and looked at all the variety of algorithms that are available for airway managers. In all told, there were 38 airway management algorithms of, of merit that were produced over the last 20 years. 14 were produced by airway societies in anesthesia, emergency medicine, intensive care, pre-hospital care of the airway, obstetric societies, pediatrics, and from a variety of places around the world, United Kingdom, Europe, Asia, Southeast Asia, and the Americas. So a tremendous amount of knowledge, a tremendous amount of effort has gone into developing these guidelines. I want you to think for a moment about what preceded all these 38 guidelines, and that is guidelines for cardiac arrest. Well, we think about cardiac arrest we know that cardiac arrest is, is universal. No matter where you are in the world, no matter what is your specialty in medicine, the guideline, the, the way we resuscitate a human being is going to be universal. And if we look at groups like the International Liaison Committee on Resuscitation, ILCOR, they have developed international consensus guidelines for cardiopulmonary resuscitation. This makes absolutely complete sense that we should have an international guideline because the basic principles of airway management and cardiopulmonary resuscitation are going to apply to all humans. There's no reason why we need to have this vast number of guidelines when, when human beings are 
universally the same when it comes to airway management, albeit there's going to be those patients who are going to be difficult for a variety of reasons. Not only do we have this consensus or the, the ability to take care of the patients the same way, all humans, all places, but also in all contexts, whether you be pre-hospital, in the emergency department, in the operating room or outside the operating room, it should be, there should be a consistency in taking care of it. So this is the, the Kuma concept, to create principles that apply across medical specialties, help the clinicians speak a common language. The role of Puma is not to compete with existing guidelines and not to be just a difficult airway guideline, but also apply to all management events and to apply to all management plans. So no matter what you're doing with an airway, the goal of Puma is to apply to all events and to all plans and all techniques. Now, the first important major guideline that came out from Puma in 2022 was the prevention of unrecognized esophageal intubation, as we discussed earlier. So why did we focus in on prevention of unrecognized esophageal intubation? And it all came from this paper, which many of you know. This is the NAP4 study. This is the survey study that was done um, in the uh, United Kingdom, where they looked at all of the national healthcare hospitals looking for serious errors in airway management over a one-year period. Every national health service hospital participated in this study. 5%, that's significant, one out of 20 cases that was picked up in this 2011 National Health Service survey included unrecognized esophageal intubation. That's a huge number, 5%. In total, there were nine cases, three in the operating room with two deaths, four in the ICU with a 50% death rate, and then two in the emergency department with 100% death rate. So a very serious problem. So what they did in the United Kingdom is they launched a, a public relations um, uh, program among anesthesiologists and emergency medicine and ICU physicians. And the name of that program was No Trace Wrong Place. And what they were teaching the clinicians in the United Kingdom was that if you don't have a capnograph trace, your tracheal tube is not in the trachea. And that was just very simple education for all these physicians. But there was a problem. Once they launched this program, they continued in the Corns report of the United Kingdom, they continued to see unrecognized esophageal intubation. This was very surprising to them. And this is what led to the Puma group deciding to produce their own guidelines, that is prevention of unrecognized esophageal intubation. Let's first define the problem, the definition of unrecognized esophageal intubation. That is the unintended placement or migration of a tracheal tube into the esophagus that is not promptly identified and addressed. Very simple definition. The risk of unrecognized esophageal intubation has been associated with emergency intubations as high as 6% critically ill patients, even elective intubations, whether it be in the operating room or other contexts. Of course, if a ch intubation is challenging because the patient has a difficult airway, this can lead to an unrecognized esophageal intubation. tends to be independent of the operator experience. It happened with new Airway management, it happened with very experienced airway manage, uh, man managers. In fact, I was just involved in a case um, in an area of the United States where this is exactly what happened. There was a variety of airway managers. It was in a gastroenterology suite, and there was a very practiced clinician, and he was helped by some practice clinicians and some new clinicians. And whatever they did, they did not recognize that they had put the tracheal tube into the, the esophagus. We would think that this would be something that would not happen in modern care, but it does happen in modern care. It's associated complications. I don't have to teach you this. I don't have to tell you this. Severe hypoxemia, pulmonary aspiration, cardiac arrest, 
brain injury and death. So very severe complications from this unrecognized esophageal intubation. A rare event. So in the NAP4 study, which looked at, I believe, 1.8 million cases, million anesthetics, there were only nine cases of unrecognized esophageal intubation. So why do we spend the energy? Why did Puma decide that it was gonna make its first guideline based upon this rare event? Well, Puma felt this is absolutely preventable. There's no reason why we should have unrecognized esophageal intubation. Failure to identify this problem leads to devastating outcomes right away. It's This is not a delay. Immediately we can have cardiac arrest, irreversible brain injury and death within a matter of just minutes after this happened and 100% preventable. Why does it happen? Why do we get unrecognized esophageal intubation? Well, first poor laryngeal identification. Maybe it's a, a new operator who doesn't know, you know, the uh, doesn't have a good feel for the variety of what the larynx should look like during laryngoscopy intubation. Lack of operator vigilance and, and complacency. We have to admit that once you've been fully trained, laryngoscopy and intubation is a fairly easy art. You take the vast majority of patients, let's say 95 to 97% of patients, laryngoscopy and intubation is fairly easy. And you can get complacent in your vigilance on intubating these patients. Glottic mimicry. This is the phenomena that the glottis begins to look like, oh, I'm sorry, the esophagus looks like the glottis. So here we have the epiglottis, the laryngoscope goes down, and to the junior laryngoscopist, and maybe to some senior laryngoscopist, and maybe if the patients had surgery or radiation, one could easily mistake this for the glottis, where of course we know that if this laryngoscope is backed out, this is actually the, not the glottis, but this is actually the esophagus that we were initially looking at. So glottic mimicry, the problem where the esophagus looks like the glottis, mimics the glottis. Variant and difficult anatomy. And of course, that patient was had a fairly normal anatomy, but we may have patients who do have radiation or surgery or masses, and it's difficult for the clinician to identify where the actual larynx is. Maybe equipment failure, maybe you have your practice with video laryngoscopy and for whatever reason, a video laryngoscope is not available. Maybe your practice is with a straight Miller blade, but today you only have available to you a Macintosh direct laryngoscope blade, not availability or failure of equipment. Blind intubation techniques such as Intubating blindly through a supraglottic airway can also lead to esophageal intubation and possibly unrecognized esophageal intubation. Poor bedside and other assessments for tracheal intubation. This study just came out in 2023, and they looked at the clinical tests for evaluating a patient airway. And because of a need for more data, they looked at both the human studies and the animal studies. What they found looking at false positives rate after esophageal intubation, that is the situation where there is an esophageal intubation, but the clinician believes there is tracheal intubation. Auscultation, false positive occurred in 14 to 18%. And this is because breaths that are given into the gastrointestinal airway, the gastrointestinal system can be auscultated in the lung fields. It can be very deceiving, thinking that you are indeed intubated in the trachea. Misting, 69%. 69% of the time when there was an esophageal intubation, the clinician appreciated misting in the tracheal tube. That's tremendous. I know a lot of clinicians who depend upon seeing misting. Well, once again, 69% of the times when there was an esophageal intubation in this study, they saw misting in the tracheal tube. Of course, we also like to depend on watching chest rise. There was insufficient data to give us a false positive rate in this study for chest rise. Dislodgement of a tracheal tube, a tracheal tube that was correctly placed in the trachea, but maybe during stylet removal, 
manipulation of the airway by, let's say, a surgeon, patient manipulation, positioning, and CPR, the tracheal tube can get dislodged into the esophagus. Monitoring issues, that is lack of having adequate capnography, it, it misinterpretation of a capnographic waveform, false positive CO2 from a patient who either consumes CO2-containing beverages or maybe received face mask ventilation for a prolonged period and, and inadequate face mask ventilation for a prolonged period before the attempt at tracheal intubation. Then lack of communication between the care providers. There's a variety of cognitive biases that can lead us to believing that our, our tracheal tube is in the correct position where actually it is in the incorrect position. The first one is confirmation bias. And this is the idea of prioritizing evidence that supports our expected diagnosis. We can have facts. This is the definition of confirmation bias. We can have facts, and then we can have facts that confirm our beliefs. And we are biased to only seeing certain amount of facts that may confirm our belief that the tracheal tube is in the right place where it's actually in the wrong place. Anchoring bias, that is fixation on one issue and reluctant to consider other issues or other diagnosis. And the example I give for fun here is, let's say you you want to purchase that, that Tesla and you love the idea of purchasing a Tesla, but then there's the, the money considerations, it's a very expensive car, there's the autopilot accidents that we've seen in the news, and you may not have ability to charge this car, but still you are fixated, you're anchored on, I wanna buy that Tesla. So anchoring bias, I believe this patient is tracheal intubated, I'm going to ignore all the other evidence. Omission bias, avoiding taking an action that might be harmful and ignoring that if you don't take any action, it might be just as harmful or it might be more harmful. Reluctance to take out a tracheal tube because you're, you're worried about what might happen. But if you leave the tracheal tube in place, the consequences can be even more dire. Hierarchies. You might recall that several years ago, there was the uh, Asiana Flight 214 that crashed, I believe, in San Francisco in the United States. And this was a situation where the senior pilot insisted that the plane was on target to land at San Francisco Airport. And the junior pilots, because of the hierarchy in the cockpit, the junior pilots refused to say anything. The plane uh, hit a, a bunker on the runway and, and three people died in that accident, all because the junior, let's say the junior clinicians, because we're talking about medicine, refused to speak up and contradict the senior member of the team. Communication. We have this problem in medicine where we get siloed. The anesthesiologist, the emergency medicine, the intensivist, the pediatrician may be speaking a different language. Their language is siloed. And the example I bring up is, you know, in emergency medicine, we have this concept of delayed sequence intubation, which is totally foreign to those of us in anesthesiologists and maybe in other fields. We don't communicate well, and that communication difficulty can lead to things like unrecognized esophageal intubation. The design of equipment may vary. Um, I have an operating room at Yale that has a very specialized MRI resistant or MRI compatible capnograph. And when I go into that room, the colors are different, the screen is different. I have to adjust my thinking to understand what I'm looking at. And in a crisis situation, this can really affect how things go in the operating. So again, Puma decided to come out with these recommendations. What are these recommendations? Well, the first part is of course, going back to what I said at the very beginning, is we want to prevent esophageal intubation. Whatever we can do to prevent esophageal intubation. Um, this is the, the Puma recommendations are based upon a Cochrane review in 2022 to use video laryngoscopy whenever it's possible, whenever it's available. It improves the glottic view. There's reduced incidence of esophageal intubation, and you can share the view of the airway with the team. So the team can help you make a decision on whether or not you're in the esophagus and the trachea. Practice what's called epiglottoscopy. And that is when you go in with your laryngoscope, whether it be a direct laryngoscope 
or a video laryngoscope, you do a sequential exposure of anatomy. So you, you know exactly where in the airway you are. So this is a laryngoscopy. Um, I, I think we saw a different laryngoscopy before. And this to a naive clinician could look like the, the trachea, but of course this is the, the esophagus. And if we back out, we see the epiglottis, we know where the larynx and trachea has to be, must be. So in epiglottoscopy, what we do is we don't look for the larynx. First off, we actually search for the epiglottis. And once we know where the epiglottis is, and by the way, when I'm doing epiglottoscopy, I'm looking at the uvula, I'm looking at the tonsils, and eventually I'll find myself in the vollecula and I'll lift the epiglottis out of the way. I'm not searching for the larynx. I'm searching for the epiglottis. And once the epiglottis is lifted out of the way, I know where my larynx must be. State the view of your laryngoscopy. Once you have done laryngoscopy, tell the team what your laryngoscopic grade is. Here we have the clinician saying, I have a grade three view. This has been proven in the literature to improve error recognition by stating what you're looking at to your entire team. Observing the intubation, of course, we've taught this for many years, following the intubation, the tube should be between the vocal cords, but in addition, the tube should be recognized to be anterior to the retinoids. So there's two checks here. Number one, tube is between the vocal cords, tube is anterior to the retinoid complexes. Exhaled carbon dioxide detention. We're going to use waveform capnography. Um, we like to verify that our capnography, our capnographic device is actually working even before we start our intubation sequence. But we want to verify all our intubations with capnography. We want to see a sustained waveform. There's been errors that have been documented in the literature about waveforms that were not sustained, that were detected initially, but then deteriorated over time. And there's causes for that also. So we want to see this nice, sustained waveform. But what are the elements of this waveform that we should be looking for during this time? There's four criteria that Puma has uh, defined for a sustained waveform. And these criteria are also outlined in a nice infographic that occurs in the published guideline. All five four criteria must be met to exclude esophageal intubation and guarantee that you have tracheal intubation. One, the amplitude of the waveform must rise during exhalation and fall during inspiration. There should be a consistent height in the waveform or an increasing amplitude over seven breaths. The peak amplitude should be more than one kilopascal. And this comes from the European uh, Resuscitation Council. And that if you have an exhaled CO2 that's less than one kilopascal, the tracheal tube is unlikely to be in the trachea in a patient who's intubated with spontaneous cardiac output. In the patient who has a cardiac arrest, less than one kilopascal either indicates that the tracheal tube is in the wrong spot or that poor cardiac resuscitation is occurring. Poor CPR is occurring and there's a very low likelihood of survival. Now, in the literature, it's often described that severe bronchospasm can cause the absence or highly reduced end tidal CO2. Unfortunately, we also see in the literature that there have been cases where the clinician has ascribed low CO2 or no CO2 to severe bronchospasm, but in autopsy, it turns out that the patient had an unrecognized esophageal intubation. So if you say this is bronchospasm, you have to 100% rule out that you're not esophageally intubated. The waveform, this is our, our fourth criteria that we look for for CO2, the waveform is clinically appropriate. If we look at the waveform that I have here in the photograph, there's definitely a CO2 waveform. It goes up and down. But at this time in this patient, we were hand ventilating the patient with very smooth breaths. 
And this waveform is not clinically appropriate. It's not clinically appropriate to what was happening in the operating room at the time. So this would not meet criteria. Now, of course, we all know that there are situations where end tidal CO2 might be present even though your tracheal tube is in the esophagus and not in the trachea. The importance of those four criteria that I gave you is that it's very unlikely that the, all four of those criteria will be met if your tracheal tube is in the esophagus. Now, what are some of the situations where you might have CO2? One, patient's been uh, consuming a, a carbonated beverage. This was a uh, a picture from actually the first time that I gave this lecture, I was in uh, Sao Paulo, Brazil um, during Mardi Gras. And uh, ingesting these carbonated beverages, you will get CO2 out of the stomach, unlikely to be sustained for a very long period of time as you're ventilating that patient. Maybe it's gastric insufflation with CO2 during a gastroendoscopy. Prolonged ventilation with face mask or mouth-to-mouth -mouth ventilation with a poorly with a with a poor face mask, aggressive face mask, or the poorly positioned supraglottic airway, bystander rescue breathing, breathing as I mentioned before, and a situation where you have a tracheoesophageal fistula where gas that's coming from the pulmonary circuit is going through that fistula and going up through the tracheal tube and being detected by your waveform analysis, your waveform capnograph. A tracheal tube that is high in the trachea or maybe the cuff is deflated, patient may be or may not be spontaneously breathing and you're picking up CO2 even though your tracheal tube is in the esophagus. There are also situations where we may have preserved oxygen saturation even though your tracheal tube is in the esophagus. Doesn't make sense, but this can happen. One, Efficient pre-oxygenation techniques that extend the safe apneic period. This is a patient getting high flow nasal oxygen and patient is well pre-oxygenated. And we know that if the patient is healthy, that may prevent desaturation for six, seven, eight minutes. And during that six, seven, eight minutes, your patient is esophagically intubated and you don't know until their oxygen saturation starts to fall after several minutes. And then keeping the, sat the uh, oxygenation technique, the pre-oxygenation technique going during your laryngoscopy may continue to give you a satisfactory saturation for a long period of time, even though you're esophageally intubated. The patient might be spontaneously ventilating, your tracheal tube is in the esophagus, but the patient keeps on breathing and maintaining the saturation. A high esophageal intubation with an uncuffed or a deflated tracheal tube, and once again, we're picking up CO2 from the larynx because your tracheal tube is high in the trachea and may not be, let's say it's in a uncuffed situation. Also, again, the situation of a tracheoesophageal fistula, the tracheal tube is in the esophagus. You're ventilating the esophagus, but via the fistula, the patient is being oxygenated. If the criteria are not met and it's not obvious what the cause is, the recommendation from Puma is to remove the tracheal tube immediately. Again, if those four criteria are not met and it's, there's not an obvious cause, we pull out the tracheal tube. And we then go back to face mask for superglottic ventilation with 100% oxygen. What's the rationale for pulling out the tracheal tube? Well, if you were under the impression that tracheal intubation was apparently easy, and you cannot conceive that this tracheal tube is in the esophagus because tracheal intubation was so easy, there's no reason not to extubate the patient. You can always place that tracheal tube back into the patient again. If you are so confident that you were tracheally intubated. I had this situation just a few months ago. I was working with a, a, a registrar and we had a large patient we intubated the patient using video laryngoscopy. In fact, the registrar did the intubation and I watched the video screen and I see all that tracheal tube go right through the vocal cords. We were both convinced that the patient was intubated. He began to bag ventilate the patient and there was no waveform on the CO2. The first thing I did is I took the CO2 monitor, I disconnected it from the circuit, I 
put her breath into that monitor and the monitor was working fine. So my command to the registrar was extubate the patient. We extubated the patient, we mass ventilated the patient, and then we reintubated and we had a CO2 capnography waveform. Both of us fully believe that this tube was in the trachea, but you know, and in my heart, I still believe that tube was in the trachea, but I extubated and I extubated appropriately because I did not have a CO2 waveform. I couldn't meet my criteria. On the other hand, if the tracheal intubation was a challenging intubation, as we see here, there is indeed a high risk that the tracheal tube is, in, is sitting in the esophagus. So once again, it, may, it, it makes sense to pull that tracheal tube out of that patient and start again. Now, there might be an exception. There might be those exceptions where removing the tracheal tube could be dangerous. And so, for example, maybe a patient is at high, very, very high risk of aspiration, and I really don't want to pull out that tracheal tube. When the decision is made that removal of the tracheal tube could be dangerous, we have to work as hard as possible to exclude that the patient is esophageally intubated. We want to exclude it. Now, how do we exclude it? Using video laryngoscopy, seeing that the tracheal tube is going into the larynx, and seeing that the tracheal tube is anterior, once again, anterior to the arytenoids. I see the tube going through the cords and I see the arytenoids posterior to the tracheal tube. Using a bronchoscope to go into the trachea and verify the tracheal rings, the esophageal wall, and seeing the crina. I'm verifying that I'm in the trachea using a flexible scope. Using ultrasound and excluding the double track sign where a tracheal tube has now splinted open the esophagus and it looks like two trachea. I want to exclude that sign to guarantee that I'm inside the trachea. This is the esophageal detector device. This is a very easy, simple, and cheap device. It's basically a bulb that's put over the tracheal tube. The bulb is squeezed, and if the bulb reinflates, that is reinflating because of the air in the uh, large pulmonary circuit. On the other hand, since the esophagus is a potential space, the bulb won't reinflate because the soft walls of the esophagus will occlude the, the, the tracheal tube. So this is actually has a 97% accuracy, but not in certain populations as we see here, as we see listed here. Clinical signs. We are all used to, we were all trained on using clinical signs, such as auscultation, um, misting, chest rise. Clinical signs are not recommended to exclude esophageal intubation. We saw earlier in the lecture that there's a very high false positive rate with the clinical signs, misting, chest rise, absence of abdominal uh, distension, distension. Even using a, a bougie, there's, there's been a teaching of using a bougie, that if a bougie is placed into the tracheal tube in the esophagus, it'll just keep going, where if it's put into a tracheal tube that's in the lung, the bougie will stop, it'll hold up. These can all occur in esophageal intubation, and it's recommended you do not use clinical signs. Breath sounds were reported oh, in every... Positive, no, in, in, we reported positive... No, Coma guidelines. So uh, very important not happy. to rely on breath sounds. Now, I mentioned the other graphic that is supplied by Puma regarding the capnography and the four criteria. There's also a quick check that is used by, that is published in the Puma guidelines. And these for rapid evaluation of other things that might be um, uh, preventing you from making the diagnosis and not in a situation where you don't want to move, remove the tracheal tube. What are the other things that we should look for? So you know, we have this quick check guide and we'll go through that. One, we want to check that there's not a malfunction of our capnography. And I mentioned this earlier. What I do is I take the line from the capnograph, I blow into it, make sure that the capnograph is working appropriately. Think for proximal issues. Maybe there's a disconnect in your, your circuit, and that's not why you're getting your CO2 
waveform. Is there a leak around the tracheal tube? Maybe there's a, a cuff herniation or a cuff deflation or a cuff rupture. It's not letting you get that CO2 back to your capnograph. Obstruction of the tracheal tube. You're not actually ventilating the patient because of some kind of obstruction. And I've definitely seen this in clinical practice with myself and my colleagues. You can't rule out the possibility of bronchospasm, but you have to be very careful about that diagnosis. The other diagnosis I've seen where there's been a poor capnograph waveform that has not met criteria is tension pneumothorax. I've seen that in the trauma bay a few times. And of course, cardiac arrest, um, especially you know, uh, cardiac arrest when there's not adequate uh, perfusion, not adequate uh, chest compressions, that is another potential cause. And other causes, I'm sure, and the Puma group is sure that there's other things that we haven't thought of that may contribute to this problem. Conclusions. Unrecognized esophageal intubation continues to occur, which is remarkable. We expect that anywhere in the world that has capnography available, and there's a, a, a worldwide effort to make capnography available, we should be able to exclude esophageal intubation and recognize it. Unfortunately, as we found from the literature, this just not is, is not true. We still continue to have this problem. Human error is a major cause, including cognitive biases, is a major cause of unrecognized esophageal intubation. This is a situation where artificial intelligence might help us to, to, to recognize when this is occurring. In fact, I think this is a very promising area for artificial intelligence, just to do a quick check on have we met all our criteria. The consequences are devastating. As we know, just in a few minutes after not observing that we have and not recognizing we have an esophageal intubation, we can get a hypoxia, brain death, and death, brain damage and death. No prior guideline has looked at this problem. This is really a unique problem. Lots of guidelines have looked at the issue of esophageal intubation. And we as practitioners are very careful about guaranteeing our tracheal tube is in the trachea, but this is actively ruling out esophageal intubation. It's a new way to look at prevention of esophageal intubation. The Puma guidelines provide aid in recognition of the causes and problems and give a rational approach to ruling out esophageal intubation. I wanna emphasize something I said a moment ago. Lots of guidelines help you to recognize tracheal intubation, but this is the first guideline to help you actively exclude esophageal intubation. It's kind of a backwards approach at looking at the airway. And with that, I wanna thank you for your attention. And once again, I'm, I'm, I'm honored to be the first speaker of 2024 and to be invited back uh, after last year. And uh, I'd be absolutely delighted to to take your questions. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you so very much, Dr. Rosenblatt. Uh, it was such a nice talk uh, on such an important topic. Actually, the word Puma has uh, been used very scarcely. And I am sure that most of the participants would now be knowing what actually Puma is. So um, basically, uh, whatever you have said about the guidelines, and it's the first guideline. So... Um, um, uh, is it the minimum checklist which we always see or we do before, uh, you know, or after doing the uh, intubation and when the capnograph is not coming? So basically, is it the minimum, bare minimum checklist which we want to do, uh, which we should be doing, or is is it just the guideline which uh, you have just mentioned? So for me, you know, we always check our uh, capnography after intubation. And uh, we always you know, want to use that to um, make sure that our tracheal tube is in the right position. Ever since this guideline came out, and I can only speak for myself, um, I make my, my registrars go through all four criteria. You know, it's enough to say, historically, it's enough to say that we have detected CO2. But to say that the, the CO2 is um, non-deteriorating, say that, the, that it makes clinical sense to actually say to a registrar, you should make sure that this 
CO2 curve is following exactly what you're doing with the patient to make sure that it's at least making a minimum uh, amount. Uh, it's making a minimal criteria of at least one kilopascal, which of course is, is very low, you know, which is very low. It's about a, a third of what you would expect, a fourth of what you would expect. These are things that help myself and the registrar not only guarantee tracheal intubation, but exclude the, the esophageal intubation. So it's hard to answer your question because it's, it's I, I'm not going to dictate people's practice, but I would say for my, it's really changed my practice. And I will actively have the registrar go through those criteria. And, and I've had the situations where we've detected CO2 and we were convinced of the tracheal intubation, but by going through those criteria and then maybe going to actively ex exclude esophageal intubation by using a flexible scope in a situation where we didn't want to move, remove the tracheal tube, re-looking with a video laryngoscope, replacing a video laryngoscope, all, all these things have been very helpful. I'll tell you one, one situation that I'm, it, it's remarkable to me how often this has happened where we've had a problem with the tracheal tube and we've used a video laryngoscope simply to look at the larynx and we have found a partial herniation of the cuff of the tracheal tube that's causing the problem. And of course, a partial herniation of the cuff of the tracheal tube could eventually lead to full extubation. This has especially been true, and I've seen it several times in the intensive care unit, where the team in the, in the intensive care unit has felt that the tracheal tube has failed, the cuff has failed, it's been misplaced, but actually Actually, it's just been herniated above the vocal cords. So that's tracheal, the, the bevel, the tip of the tracheal tube is sitting between the cords, but the cuff is above the cords. This has been um, a really useful uh, or, or a fantastic use of video laryngoscopy just to verify tracheal intubation, verify that the tube is deep enough into the larynx. All right, thank you. So we have uh, uh, two more questions, but before everyone signs out, I have a request that kindly fill in the feedback form, which has uh, just been shared. Uh, ma'am, I have a question, if you allow me. Uh, yes, please, go ahead. Uh, sir, I wanted to ask that frequency of uh, respiration or breathing frequency or breathing, uh, rather it's appropriate word for it, uh, does it cause the uh, changes in the quality of uh, ETCO2 or capnography? Like uh, breathing and uh, incre increasing the number of breaths or decreasing the number of breaths, does it cause any changes in the ETCO2 during this period? Well, we're talking we're talking about a short period. So, are, are you saying spontaneous ventilation or positive pressure ventilation? It's positive pressure. It's not sp spont spontaneous. Spontaneous. You know, yes. even with even with spontaneous ventilation, um, we should be able to make the criteria. Certainly, we wouldn't see the CO2 going down. Um, if the patient is spontaneously breathing at a regular uh, rate, we should see the same uh, clinically adequate uh, uh, waveform. So I think in the very short period of time that we're talking about, let's say seven breaths, I wouldn't expect, I, I would expect that they would meet criteria. Let me say that. I hope that answers the question. Uh, I hope so. Uh, so uh, we have another question from uh, Shahid Dar, and he has actually two questions that the role of ultrasound in preventing the esophageal intubation or confirmation, probably he's asking about the recent guidelines. Is there any role of ultrasound? And secondly, he's also asked that video laryngoscope versus conventional laryngoscope, what is uh, the esophageal intubation rate as observer or second eye can be helpful? Okay. Um, ultrasound, first of all, absolutely. Um, it's it's probably not as uh, great as we would hope, but certainly ultrasound has a role. Um, certainly with tracheal intubation, one, once the patient's been tracheally intubated, ultrasound, you know, can help you identify the position of the tracheal tube, but it, it can be difficult. What's more promising is the motion of the tracheal tube. So as the tracheal tube enters into the larynx, you get um, what's called a snowstorm effect, where you get a sudden artifact in the ultrasound. So that can verify tracheal intubation. And of course, we can look at lung slide. Um, we can look, you know, on both one unilateral or, or bilateral. And so in, in many ways, that can confirm tracheal intubation. As far as esophageal intubation, 
I just showed that one picture of the double track sign where the esophagus, of course, in its normal state has this kind of what we call a clover leaf appearance. And if it's if it's dilated and you see a, an actual lumen so that there's two lumens, that's it. So there's two lumens. That's an indication that something is splinting open the esophagus. So, yes, I believe that ultrasound, you know, has a role. Um, it, of course, has to be immediately available. Uh, in emergency airway care, we often, to a small extent, discount the use of a flexible scope because a flexible scope takes time to secure and set up. It has to be by the bedside. Same thing with ultrasound. To really be helpful in this situation, ultrasound has to be by the bedside. Now, as, as far as video laryngoscopy and esophageal intubation, all we really know from the literature is that is video laryngoscopy decreases the incidence of esophageal intubation as compared to direct laryngoscopy. So that was, I believe, very definitively in the last uh, Cochrane systemic review that we do have decreased esophageal intubation with video laryngoscopy. There are drawbacks to video laryngoscopy. You have to have it available. There's the expensive video laryngoscopy, and there's the training. I have a confession. And that confession is every intubation I do, whether it be an easy intubation or a difficult intubation or a failed intubation, I use video laryngoscopy. And it's not because I think that every intubation is going to be difficult, but I want to be facile. I want to be highly trained in video laryngoscopy so that when I do come across a difficult case, I'm the best person using it. And, and to me, it's like a my right hand. So I'm using it all the time. Um, when I have my registrars using it, uh, I use it so I can observe what they're doing. I think video laryngoscopy has been one of the greatest advances to airway care. And again, it, it may help us with the difficult airway, but with the easy airway, what we're doing is we're training ourselves how to use video laryngoscopy. Uh, yeah, thank you, uh, Dr. Professor Rosenblatt. Actually, the two points specifically which you have uh, mentioned, one, one right now and one earlier, the, those are the points which are the crux of, I think, the uh, difficult intubation. One was like to ensure the uh, uh, rec unrecognized official intubation and to recheck. One was to recheck the uh, endotracheal tubing, uh, the, uh, the CO2 tubing uh, where you have to just blow it and check whether it is patent or not. And second mm -hmm. one is this one that whether or not uh, there is a, a, a anticipated difficult intubation, if uh, you have or the or your hospital or your institute has video laryngoscope, just get the hang of it, just use it, no matter whether the patient has difficult airway or not, so that you get the best uh, maximum practice out of it. Uh, so we also have another question from, um, Dr. Naseem Javed. Uh, Dr. Naseem, would you like to unmute yourself and uh, directly ask question from Dr. Rosenblatt? Or should I, uh, should I read it out for you? I would request that you kindly unmute your microphone so that you can ask the question. Naseem Javed. Oh, okay. So if, uh, you know, in order to save the time, he has asked that considering the nuisance of the esophageal intubation detection, Describe the three potential pitfalls of the scenarios which can lead to the misinterpretation of the clinical clues and how would you address each to ensure the accurate identification and correction of the issue? I think one of two points you have already mentioned, you can actually add in whatever he has just asked uh, Dr. Rosenblatt. He's asking about the clinical scenario in which, you know, we can have, uh, we, we can have the problem. I, you know, I think that the primary one is human error. And that is our intrinsic biases. We tracheal intubation is is so easy in the vast majority of cases that we are biased to to not believe we can have esophageal intubation. And I think that's where your team comes in, where the the team can help you to make a decision. And again, that's another reason why I like video laryngoscopy because I am not the only one who can see. Very often I'll have a, a nurse or a surgeon who's also watching the video screen just out of interest. 
So having the, the team is very important. Addressing your personal biases is very important. I work with a lot of caretakers who, operators who are doing airway management, who are not necessarily engaged in in what they're doing. I, I shouldn't say a lot. There, there's a few who are not necessarily engaged with what they're doing. To them, being in the operating room is a job. And I think that, you know, we, we, we're we taking care of human beings. We're taking care of a, another person. I think we have to be terribly engaged in what we are doing. And it's someone who just is there to put a tracheal tube in place that I, I worry about. So it's very good when I have video laryngoscopy that uh, the, I have not just myself, but I have other people who are watching the screen. That's that's one situation. So um, getting rid of our, our own uh, biases. A second situation, of course, is the difficult airway. And this is the patient who is recognized to be a difficult airway, whether they have a mass or they have a history of radiation. And it's important that we look at that patient, do an evaluation of that patient based upon our own decision-making. Now, this is something I discussed last year at this meeting. I discussed a new tool that was introduced by the ASA in the airway guidelines, and that's the decision-making tool. And in that decision-making tool, what you, what you carefully do is you, you ask the question, is this patient going to be difficult to intubate? And, and not, not talking about another clinician, I'm talking about the, the primary clinician who's going to do the, the intubation, do I think that patient can be difficult to intubate? And if the answer to that question is yes, do I think the patient would be difficult to ventilate at all? Not completely, but somewhat difficult. Is that patient at aspiration risk? Is that patient at risk of oxyhemoglobin desaturation? And if the patient is difficult to intubate and any one of these other three factors, I seriously have to consider awake intubation because I've said that it's potential for total airway failure. So I think the, the, the second scenario is the one where we really have to critically look at the patient before we start, before we start taking care of that patient and, and make decisions on, on whether or not we should do awake intubation. Wake intubation will only occur in about 0.5% of patients. There are some clinicians who will never do awake intubation in their entire career, and that is absolutely perfectly fine. But we always have to think about it. We always have to look at every patient and think about that. The third situation I think that we might have is equipment failure. And we rely tremendously on our equipment, whether it be our laryngoscopes or our capnography or our O2 analyzers. And I think we have really have to make sure that all our equipment is in working order before we take a fellow human being and subject them to, to induction of anesthesia and airway management. So I think those are the three areas. The, um, the equipment failure, the situation where we have misinterpreted or we we maybe we took an easy way out with a patient who has a, a difficult airway and the third being our own internal biases. And I think of most of us, they always encounter either form of uh, the uh, these uh, these potential uh, uh, problems which you know we encounter at the patient side. So there was another question by Awais Anwar that will the ventilator deliver tidal volume? Probably that's what he's asking. Now, will the ventilator deliver tidal in the case of esophageal intubation? I think I'm asking, uh, he's asking about, uh, will the ventilator deliver tidal volume makes any changes? Or would they, I don't know, I really I think, can't. I think that's a wonderful question. Um, I think it's a wonderful question. And I think what we will see that the ventilator will deliver volumes, but you won't get the return volume. So your spirometry, you won't see the return volume to the ventilator. Now, if you have your flows high on your anesthesia machine, you may not witness this, but with a low flow on your anesthesia machine, you may not get the return volume. Your ventilator bellows uh, probably won't fill. So that's a very, that's a fascinating question. Something I have not thought about, but I think that that would be true. Ventilator will deliver the volume, but you won't get the return volume. So what, what would happen in the case of esophageal intubation in such patients? Uh, 
I think you would find over a short period of time that your ventilator um, bellows was not refilling and it looked oh. like you had a tremendous leak. And again, right. I, I haven't thought much about this, but the, I think it's, that's why I think it's a marvelous question. Right. And there was another question by Ali Abbas Rahat Sayyid that he's asking about the use of fiber optic bronchoscopy and its role in uh, esophageal intubation or difficult intubation. Um, absolutely. Uh, for its role in esophageal intubation, um, you know, it's there's two very different now. There's there's typically two very different pictures in what we look at with uh, if if we put a flexible scope at the esophagus versus the the uh, tracheally placed uh, tracheal tube. If you have it immediately available, it's it's very important to exclude the esophageal intubation. Now, on the other hand, I've seen patients with esophageal malaysia uh where the or, or tracheal excuse me tracheal malaysia pardon me where placing a flexible scope into the trachea at times i've had clinicians believe that they were in the esophagus because of the tracheal malaysia so i think you have to look at every clinical situation differently and, and especially occurs with very large patients patients who have a long smoking history um where the trachea will almost look like the esophagus. And the key there is to look for even the subtle presence of tracheal rings. Usually you can pick up tracheal rings. Now, okay. you can have patients with tracheomalacia or esophageal invagination into the trachea. So you have a trachea, it has rings, but the esophagus keeps, uh, in the, in, uh, I'm blocking on the word, keeps uh, coming into the trachea and obstructing it. And again, that can look like esophagus. All right. So uh, we are taking the last questions. That's by Nader Adil. Uh, he's asking, can we use rigid bronchoscope to avoid uh, intubation, esophageal intubation? Rigid, if, you, if one is trained in rigid bronchoscopy, um, I would caution anyone not strictly trained in it. Mm -hmm. uh, I would caution them not to use it. It can be a very traumatic device, uh, but, it, but certainly it can be used to, to verify tracheal intubation. Uh, to uh, exclude that the tracheal tube is in the esophagus, certainly. But again, I would I would leave that to a uh, pulmonologist. I'd leave that to a thoracic surgeon because it can be a very traumatic device. I, I will tell you that at the very end of the ASA difficult airway uh, infographic, we do have bronchos virgin bronchoscopy as a rescue device because it is so effective, but it is traumatic. All right. Thank you so very much, Dr. Rosenblatt. We have two seniors over here. One is Dr. Akhtar Wahid Khan, who is the senior most anesthesiologist and uh, uh, one of the senior most uh, anesthesiologists in Pakistan. And he has got uh, an experience of more than 30 or 40 years. So I would request him to have a few words. And then we will have the president of Pakistan Society of Anesthesiologists, Dr. Shabbir, after him so that uh, we he can conclude the session. Uh, Dr. Akhtar, are you with us? Dr. Wahid? Uh, Dr. Uh, Dr. Shabir is here. Yes. Dr. Shabir, you yes. can. Uh, yes. So we have, we have Hello, everyone. Hello, everyone. Hello, and very good time management as well. I will just share. Uh, think, my... Sorry, sorry to interrupt, Dr. Shabir. I think there is a background voice with your. Uh, uh, with uh, your... There's nobody in the room except me. Yeah. I, so would I, request the, I, I, me I would request the host to kindly mute that voice, please. Yes. Yes. Now, Thanks. Uh, things okay? No, yes. you can hear me? Yes. yes. The lecture was very good. It was concise, it was to the point, and with the best time management I've ever seen. I would just share my two experiences with difficult intubation. Uh, both patients were male and uh, with severe ankylosis of uh, spine, you know, it was a bamboo spine. One patient had hardly any mouth opening, and I went for the flexible bronchoscope with awake intubation. Uh, 
and it was very spontaneous and very easy. The other patient had a mouth opening with the severely ankylosed spine and it was a, an easy intubation with video laryngoscope. So I think both the gadgets are very good to avoid the esophageal intubation you know, in difficult airways. And thank you very much uh, for the nice lecture. Thank you very much, Dr. Asma, for giving me time to give my, my, my feedback. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Rosenblatt. Thank you, Dr. Uh, Shabir, for joining us. And I'm really grateful to everyone who, who has, but I would appreciate everyone who has joined today's session because today is the first day of uh, the year. Uh, I'm really grateful to Dr. Rosenblatt that he's our first speaker, but at the same time, I, um, I'm also uh, would like to thank every participant who participated and joined our lecture on the day one. That means that they are dedicated for the academic sessions and their learning. So uh, good work and uh, keep it up. And thank you so very much, everyone. And thank you, Dr. Rosenblatt. Really grateful to you. Okay, have take care. Yeah, have a You too. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye, -bye. Bye.